Hi, thanks for joining us today. If this ministry has impacted your life, we want to hear about it. You can send us your story at amen at vnchurch.com. Also, we would love if you would partner with us financially. You can go to vnchurch.com and click the Give Online or text your donation amount to 757 230 Hello, how are we feeling this morning? We feeling good? Okay, this is 11 o'clock service. Y'all can do way better than that. How are we feeling this morning? All right. Gosh, the little rain can't keep us down. Amen. Well, welcome to Vineyard, everybody. My name is Parker Mathias. I'm one of the pastors here on staff, um, and I'm so excited to speak today. I, I do just want to take a moment to thank our amazing senior pastors, Pastor Andy and Sharon Mead. Can we give it up for them real quick? I mean... You know, over 25 years ago, they said yes to God, and they started this church, and they said, hey, it's going to be a church of every generation, and so they reached a young, thought he had it all together, 16-year-old, and, and gave him a shot. I would not be on this stage if it wasn't for them, but you didn't come today to hear me gain uh, brownie points with my bosses, so who wants to be encouraged? Anybody want to be encouraged today? If you've heard me speak, you know I like participation. Um, this isn't a one-way street. It's a conversation, so feel free to talk back to me if I say something. Uh, just don't be rude, you know? That's all I, that's all I have. Uh, so we've been in this series called Making My Life Count, which is so awesome. I love talking about God. It's so life-giving. If you walk away from a conversation about God and it wasn't life-giving, you either A, are talking to the wrong person, or two, talking about the wrong God. <laughs> um, but, but millennials, right? Millennials uh, are, are one of the first generations, even though we give them a bunch of crap, um, to actually say, hey, when I choose a career and I choose a job, I actually want it to make a difference. I don't just want to get a paycheck. I want to know that I'm doing something bigger than just my bank account getting a direct deposit. And so we have been talking about this concept of making our life count. And we only get one. We only get one life on this earth. And I don't know about you, but I refuse to let it be a stepping stone into eternity. I want it to mean something. I want it to be used for something greater than myself. Like the song you just heard, this life means nothing if it ends with me. I want the best life possible. And I think we can agree on that to some extent, right? I mean, but by whose standard is this best life? I guarantee you, if you ask the person next to you, their definition of best life is much different than yours, right? How do we ever really know what's best? I mean, this is coming from a guy who has a perfectionist problem and is OCD. I can tell you there's a right or wrong way to clean something. But when it comes to actually making life decisions, how do we know what's best? I mean, if we're honest, we really only know what's better. You know, we know what's better through life experiences. That's how we know. I can tell you that through experience, it is better and best to roll up your window if there's even a chances of rain in your car, right? I can tell you through experience that you always get the popcorn refill before the movie starts. You get a box, you put it in there, it's great. You want to know more? You let me know. I got the secrets to it. Um, but we know, we know through experience but how do you know what's best when you've never experienced the decision you're trying to make? How do you know how to best parent your first child? How do you know um, God, how to be the best business owner if you haven't even started a business yet? What career to choose? What city to move to? What uh, person to marry? You see, in order to know what's best for my life, it's going to take someone who's not bound by the same pressures as I am, right? It's going to take someone who knows in intricate detail my past, my present, my future capabilities and purpose, and can make those decisions completely objectively. But perfection is impossible. It's impossible for you. It's impossible for me. You know, if we want to know what truly is best— it's, it's going to take someone who is perfect. 
I mean, the only way to know what's best in every single circumstance is to seek the opinion who someone in themselves is perfect. Now, I don't know what you walked in here with today or or what ideas or notions about God you've brought with us, um, what past hurts you're carrying from either life or just previous churches you've been a part of. But what I do know, and I think we can all agree on, that is if you want the best, you got to seek the best, right? If you want something that is awesome and great, you've got to seek that something that's awesome and great. Church, if no man or woman is perfect, then my best life will never be found in another human being. It just won't. I need someone who is above human error, who, who maybe created us, a God who loves us, a God who says, I know the number of hairs on your head. I formed you in your mother's wombs. I can count all the steps of your life. That kind of God. Because better is found in experiences, but the best life possible is found in Jesus. It's the only thing that makes sense. I am convinced that we miss God's best for our life because our focus is off. And so that's why the title of my message today is Fix My Focus. Look to the person next to you say, fix your focus. Okay, look to the person you neglected, tell them to fix their focus too. You see, I will be the best husband I can be by focusing on Jesus. I will be the best pastor that I can be by focusing on Jesus. You will be the best employer, parent, child, student, co-worker you can be by fixing your eyes on something that is best and perfect and greater than anything found on this earth. See, I want to talk to you today about a guy that lived roughly 2,000 years ago. And on the outside, everything was going really great for him. I mean, he was a religious leader. Um, He was an eloquent speaker. He spoke multiple languages. He was well-studied, well-versed. I mean, shoot, he was known across the region for his work as the religious leader in, in, in his religion. On the outside, things were great. And we're at the point in this guy's life where the historical Jesus lived was crucified on the cross, resurrected on the third day, therefore launching the first Christian church, right? This movement that we refer to as Christianity started during this guy's lifetime. Now Saul was a Jewish leader. That's who I'm talking about. Some of you may know him as Paul. But Saul was a Jewish leader and uh, his job was actually to suppress this movement that Jesus had started. His job was to hunt down, track, put on trial, and execute people who claimed to follow Jesus. I mean, he thought that this was the best thing. He was convinced that Jesus' movement was a threat to Judaism, that it uh, was a threat to his religion, it was a threat to his people. I mean, there's no way he could let a false messiah come in and just destroy everything that he's worked for, just ruin the people's perspective of God. Saul thought this was best. And so he gets approval from his his, uh, governmental leadership and, and his religion to travel to a city called Damascus. And now, um, his, his goal was to find more people who follow Jesus and arrest them. And so on his journey there, something kind of insane happens. Let's read about it in Acts. It says, As he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. Saul found himself confronted with the very Jesus he'd been fighting against this whole time. At this time, he thought, or at least he didn't want to believe, that the Son of God was actually real. That he actually came to this earth and did what everybody claimed that that he did and, and lived this life and died this death and was resurrected. This reality that he was facing was earth shaking for him. So much so that the Bible actually says Saul was blinded. All he could see was God's light. That's it. He could just see light. He could see nothing else. Have you ever come face to face with the reality that you refused to accept? Yeah? Maybe it's a health diagnosis that you wanted to avoid. You know, maybe it's a hurt that you've just tried not to recognize or acknowledge. It's an addiction you turn a blind eye to or, or even a personality flaw that unintentionally pushes people away. Saul is having that moment right now. He's realizing that everything he thought was best for his life and the life for others is in fact not the best thing. See, I can tell you though, church, this is one of the most awesome places to be. The times that I have grown the most have been the times where I have been most honest before God. See, Jesus was trying to get Paul to a position of honesty. Now I have four questions for you today, four questions that I want to pose to you for you to ask yourself. Questions that I think will prompt thought, self-reflection, and hopefully growth inside of your life and your faith journey. 
So the first one, they're all in your outline. My, my first question for you is, if we're going to fix our focus on Jesus, we need to ask ourselves, what reality do I need to face? What reality do I need to accept? What reality do, do, do I need to say, God, this is the life that you've given me. This is the circumstance that I have, and it's not perfect, Lord, but what do you want me to do in it? How do you want me to act? God, what do you say about this circumstance? Avoiding it's not going to do anything because that's what we tend to do, right? When we come face to face with hard truths, our, our initial response is to lock it down, put it in a room, lock the key, dig a deep hole into our heart, put some dirt over it, put a nice little throw rug so that we can stand on top of it and never focus on it again, right? I mean, that's, just, that's what we do. See, but this only prolongs growth. It, it traps us in a false reality of normal or a false reality of, of things going well. See, God doesn't want you to, to have to go into a crisis, but sometimes it's moments of intense emotional responses or intense moments in life that cause us to look at and say, is this really best for my life? Is this really what God has for me? Paul was literally blinded because he was too focused on everything around him. I mean, if I'm honest, I wish God would blind me to things sometimes. I wish he would blind me to the opinions of other people. I wish God would blind me to the shame of the mistakes I made 10 years ago. I wish God would, would just hold back the pressures and the fear that I have for what my future is going to look like. You see, I, I have to ask myself, though, why did Jesus need to blind Paul? Why was that something that, that needed to happen, and what does that say about ourselves? Well, I think Jesus was getting at the core of who he was. He was saying, Saul, if I strip you of your religious title— if I strip you of your accomplishments and, and everything that you've worked for and your hate for Christians and your Roman citizenship and being able to speak all these languages, if I took that away from you, who are you? And I think God looks at us too and he says, hey, if I take away your job, if I freeze your bank account, right? If, if, if this all around you, your clothes on your back, are no, you're no longer able to afford those, who are you? His foundation was off. It was hanging on temporary, worldly things. But if you want to live the best life possible, we need to ask ourselves, what are we building that life on top of? Paul was blinded so that all he could see was God's light. And, and Jesus says this in, in Matthew 6. He says, But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all of these things will be given to you as well. The message translation says it this way. Pay attention to the wording. It says, Steep your life in God reality. God initiative, God provisions. Don't worry about missing out. You'll find all your everyday human concerns will be met. The most important thing for our live church, the most valuable thing that we can receive is the love of God. Because it does not change. It is unwavering. In order to properly build our lives um, on our foundation, we have to first acknowledge uh, that our reality is here. This is where we're at. And then we need to say, hey, what am I going to build on top of that? God, my reality is that I'm broke. God, my reality is that I, I manage finances, finances poorly. Or my reality is that my home life isn't what it should to be, God. Or my marriage is struggling. Lord, this is my reality. We have to acknowledge where we are so we can begin to ask this second question on your outline. What makes up my foundation? What makes up my foundation? And this is arguably one of the most important questions you're going to ask yourself today because if this is off, if a foundation is off, it really doesn't matter what else you build on your spiritual life, right? I mean, we live in Virginia Beach. We know what hurricanes do to houses on the oceanfront. Uh, Jesus says a house built on the sand will be just washed away, but a house built on, on the rock will never be moved. This verse says, seek Jesus first. Go to God first. You want to do better in school? It starts with Jesus. Learn some discipline in your faith and let that overflow into, into your studies. You want to have a successful business? Go to Jesus first so you can understand how to better handle business deals and employees and how to treat people the right way. You want to have a better marriage? Go to Jesus first. Or shoot, learn from my season of singleness. I've learned that I need to stop praying for the right one to come along and start praying for me to make the man he needs me to be. Amen. Some of y'all needed to hear that. But that's Jesus. Don't put that on me. That's... <laughs> See, Saul was denying the very person that could take his life and transform it into something he never thought possible. Is my foundation built on the approval of my parents? 
is my foundation built on my accomplishments as, as a student or as an employee? Is it social media? I just love when we get all these likes and followers. Is that what my foundation is built on? Or is my foundation built on a rock that will never fail, right? Like a God who is unchanging, you know, I just feel like we can no longer settle for bits and pieces of who God is. We need to start asking for the whole pot. I'm tired of just standing on an uneven surface. God, I want to be on you. I want to stand firm and tall in who you are. So Saul's friends, they bring him to Damascus because, you know, he's blind and doesn't know where he's going. And so he gets there and he meets a man named Ananias. And now before they get there, um, God had actually spoken to Ananias and he said, hey, there's this guy named Saul coming through. You're going to pray for him because he's blind and he's going to be able to see again because you pray for him. Ananias goes, you said who? God says, Saul. Ananias goes, Saul, the guy who's like hunting people down that are like me? God's like, yeah. And Ananias, I imagine, is like, well, surely, Lord. <laughs> Let's talk about this real quick. Surely, God. Like, it'd be better for him to be blind, right? Like, because then he can't see me, and he can't see other people, and he can't hunt us down. And <laughs> surely, God, the person at my job doesn't deserve all the glory, Lord, because I did all the work. Surely, Lord, this one gets me all the time. That person's getting married before me? Oof. God, surely, Lord, like, like surely, <laughs> you know? But I am so thankful, can I be honest? I am so thankful that God's best is not my best. I am so thankful that God's purpose for my life and the life of others has nothing to do with what I think is good or right or wrong or best or not best, because here's what God says about that. Um, He responds to Ananias, he says, Go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. See, statistics say that the best indicator of your future is your past. But Jesus says that his best actually outweighs our past mistakes. That we can sin in our previous um, season of life, and God says that has no indicator on where I'm going to bring you in the future. Amen. See, Ananias is obedient. He prays for Saul, and the Bible says that like scales fall from his eyes, and he can see again. And then Saul, he spends several years being obedient and learning and growing and being discipled and um, disciplined and learning about the faith and reading God's word and hearing these stories about Jesus. He's got people in his life who are keeping him accountable and helping him grow so that he can fulfill the purpose that God has for him. And then he changes his name from Saul to Paul. It kind of just happens like from one page to another. So I don't know if like he was trying to shake his reputation as Saul or people just kept mixing it up like at Starbucks. He's like, Paul, no, Saul, Paul. Oh, I guess I'm Paul now. You know, like I don't, I don't really know what happened, but that, that's where he is. And so we see that God is in fact using Paul to do exactly what he told Ananias that he would do, to bring the gospel to Gentiles which is non-Jewish people. And so he's traveling around the Middle East and um, he's he's preaching and he's teaching and, you know, years go by and he's got people he's mentoring and discipling and, and things are going great. But there's this moment in Paul's life that has always fascinated me. It's a moment where God actually tells Paul no to something that on the outside seems like a really good opportunity. It seems like it'd be beneficial for not only Paul, but everyone around him. You see, Paul has this idea of bringing the gospel into Asia. He wants to travel to Asia and preach and teach and let people know about Jesus. And God says, no. And you know that saying that people say, right? Like, God always answers your prayers. It's either yes, no, or not yet. But what if the answer doesn't make sense? (laughs) Right? That's nice to hear. Like, oh, he answers me. But what if it doesn't make sense? Right? It makes sense for Paul to go to Asia and preach. Like, he's gifted at it. He's got a crazy life story. He's very relatable. Um, he's, he's just uh, exudes power and authority in the kingdom of heaven. Like, God, why wouldn't you want people to hear the truth? Well, this is uh, what exactly happens in Acts 16. It says, Paul and his companions traveled throughout the region of Phrygia and Galatia, having been kept by the Holy Spirit from preaching the gospel in the province of Asia. And then it keeps going. And it says, When they came to the border of Mycia, they traveled, or they tried to enter Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus would not allow them to. God would not let Paul preach. Does this make sense to you guys? I mean, if you know the story of Paul, you know that he's like 
one of the greatest evangelists, first church planner. Like, he's just an amazing guy. And it makes me laugh, too, because uh, God says no to Asia, and then Paul kind of, like, uh, tries to pull a fast one on God. Like, uh, he tries to go to Bithynia, which is Asia Minor. Um, and so Paul's kind of like, hey, no Asia? Well, what about right here? You know, just let me slide in right here. Like, it's like if you give a cupcake to a little kid and you say, but don't eat it till I return and you walk away, what is going to happen? Like surely but slowly they eat the icing. Well, you didn't tell me I couldn't eat the icing, you know? So, so Paul tries to be slick a little bit. And here's the honest truth. I don't know if I would have been as obedient as Paul. <laughs> Right, like, like I'm in Lidl. I love Lidl. It's cheap. Um, it's right by my house, and I love shopping at Lidl. I have my headphones in, listening to worship music, praying sometimes, just asking God about some things, and he'll tell me no. And I'll be like, okay, God, but like, did you mean <laughs> no to what I was praying about? Or like, no, I shouldn't put three frozen pizzas in my cart. Like, I just really need to know what exactly you want from me, God. You know, <laughs> like... <laughs> Like, God, I need to know, because obedience is hard. It's difficult. You know, I start justifying things. I start kind of playing, like, a conversation game with God. But, like, God, it'd be a great opportunity, and, like, people will hear about you, and then, like, maybe this will happen, and, and all of these things. Let me give you another example. I have a dog. Her name is Lady. She's the best. I love her. Um, she's cute. She's half husky. Um, she is an amazing dog. Um, she is obedient, man. She loves people. She's protective, um, and she also likes taking selfies with me, um, so that's nice. Um, I don't have kids or wife, so like this is what my Instagram looks like, you know? <laughs> um, but the other day, she cornered a possum on the fence. I don't know if you'll be able to see it, but um, she, th this is her at the fence, and then the possum is, oh, Brandon, can you help me out? <laughs> Um, so she like cornered, there you go. She corners the possum um, and she would not get away, like don't judge me. But I took a two by four and I pushed the possum on the other side of the fence and I grabbed her collar and I ran back inside. Um, but that's not the story I want to tell you. This actually happened about a week and a half, two weeks ago. And um, did I say she's a great dog? She's a great dog. Um, you know, she's just so awesome. Like she was housebroken at like two months. She'll sit by the back door when she wants to go outside. If you go to your car, she won't rush out. She'll wait for you to say come. Um, she's just really great. She loves going on runs. She loves going for car rides. Uh, and the other day I was going to bed and all I have to do is say upstairs and she'll come with me upstairs. Um, she's got a doggy bed in my room that she sleeps in. Um, and so we were getting ready for bed and I'm laying down, scrolling through my phone, just waiting to kind of fall asleep. And she starts whining. And she starts pacing the floor. Um, and she's, she's half husky, so her whine is really annoying. It's like, <laughs> it's like she's talking to you, but whining. Uh, and now she's a great dog, but she's also really slick. Like, you'll feed her, and then another roommate will come home, and she'll act like she didn't just eat food, you know? Uh, so I've learned that when she's whining late at night, it typically means two things, you know? It either means that uh, somebody just came home, uh, that she doesn't know who they are, and she wants to go around and play with them and smell them and see who they are. Or two, uh, she saw some unattended food, and she's trying to go back down there and get some more food. One time, she, uh, my roommate left out a box of pizza, and she ate the whole thing. Um, and the crazy thing is, is the box didn't even come on the floor. She got up on the counter, ate it, closed the box, and went back on to <laughs> You think I'm joking, but I'm not. That really actually happened. Uh, I was like, are you sure she got it? Because there's no mess. Um, anyway, so she's whining, and I'm just like, go to sleep, lady. I roll over. I pass out. 6 a.m. rolls around. She's whining again. And I'm thinking, ugh, got one more hour until my alarm goes off. And so I hush her. I, I roll over, and I'm just like trying to go back to sleep. But she keeps whining. She keeps going on, and, and I'm, I'm trying to like reason with her, like just lay down, like sit, lay down. Like I'm trying to do all of that, but she's just not having it. So I get really frustrated. I get upset. I fling my covers off really, really aggressively. My feet slam on the floor. I start huffing and puffing as if for some reason she cares about my passive aggressiveness. Um, and as I stood up, I realized that I done messed up, y'all. I done made a mistake. I went to go open my door, but I couldn't because there was a trail of poop. <laughs> and not like the easy to pick up, let me grab a paper towel real quick and flush it down the toilet kind of poop. It was like a trail of sludge kind of thing going on, you know, like, like I look over at her like, what's going on? And she just looks at me like, I know, I need to go outside. <laughs> and I'm like, ah. Oh. Um, I did not expect to wake up that morning and see like a lukewarm bad batch of Hershey chocolate bars on my floor. And so like, 
I clean it up, and it turns out she was sick, and she just wanted to go outside really bad. But it was that day, it was that day that I knew and realized that I don't always know what's best, right? I mean, I recognized it was weird the night before, uh, but I never, I never thought that I'd wake up to that. And that's a funny story, but how relatable is that in life? Like how many times do we enter situations thinking we know all the information, thinking we're fully equipped and prepared to solve a problem or make a decision, and then we decide to do something and it ends up hurting other people. Or we decide not to do something and we miss out on the opportunity that God has been waiting to give us all along. See, Paul, though he tries to pull a fast one, is obedient to God. He says, fine, I won't do it, Lord. I'll just wait for you to tell me where to go. And so they kind of make camp. They travel a little bit more. They make camp. And that night, Paul gets a vision from God. And so this is what that vision was. It says, during the night, Paul had a vision of a man of Macedonia standing and begging him, come over to Macedonia and help us. He says, after Paul had seen the vision, we got ready at once to leave for Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. I mean, Paul's excited. He's like, okay, Lord, this is what I'm called to do. You've finally given me an opportunity. It's not Asia. That's fine. I'll go to Macedonia. This is great. And so they head out. To have the obedience of Paul is mind-blowing to me. I mean, have you ever met a kid um, that says these words, parents don't have a heart attack? Yes, sir. No, ma'am. Thank you. Can I help you with anything? (laughs) Right? Like, I used to have a student call me Mr. Pastor Parker, and I thought it was the best thing ever. (laughs) But we are resistant to those. I'm like, what are you you up to? What do you need from me? You want a dollar? I don't know. Do you need, what's what's going on? I'm just confused right this. And we're resistant to those things because good things are often uncommon in life, unfortunately, right? Like, like, this is different than my reality, so I'm going to kind of push it away. I'm going to kind of push it to the side. We're resistant to good things because they're different. But here's the thing. God's obedience produced an opportunity. And so that brings me to my next question. If we want to fix our our focus on Jesus, what area of my life needs more godly obedience? Write that down on your outline. What area of my life needs more godly obedience? And if we're honest, it's everywhere, right? I mean, I'm a pastor. I could probably pray more. You know, like there's, there's things that we can knickknack all day, but the question I want you to ask yourself is, is what area of my life, if I decided to be obedient right now, if I said yes right now to this one area, would have the biggest impact in my life? We want to be strategic here, right? We don't want to be overwhelming, but just if you said yes to Jesus now, what would your life look like? How would that be different? See, for some of you, it's, it's starting to tithe. You've been coming to church for a while. You've been a Christian for a long time. And God wants to show you, show you that he is Jehovah Jireh, God my provider. But he can't do that unless you trust him with your finances. Some of you, your next step of obedience is merely to just to show up to church on time. God's like, I want to speak to you. I want, I want to move in your life and worship. I need you to be here when that video starts playing. You know, or, or, or for some of you, it's, it's you need to take the Paul next step of getting people around you to encourage you and pray for you and edify you. So you need to stop by that small group board on your way out. Or some of us, we're ready to go. God is calling us to serve, but you haven't done growth track yet. Step three is right after service. So see the banner in the hallway. There's food provided in child care. Like this, we make it so easy for you to do it. And so that, maybe that's your next step. Here's what Paul says in Romans 12. He says, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. God is not interested in producing carbon copies of individuals. What he wants to do is transform your soul, your mind, and your body. He wants to make you into the person you're supposed to be. So when we're talking about obedience, I'm not talking about following rules. I'm talking about your love for God displaying itself in actions, right? I mean, my top love language is acts of service and words of affirmation. And so when people do things that show me they care, that means so much for me. And so God is saying, hey, if you love me, be obedient. Show me, because I have the best life possible. You may not understand right now, but it's coming. See, Paul and his disciples, they make their way to this city called Philippi. Um, And now Philippi was kind of like the New York of the time. There's a lot of different ethnicities and cultures and blending all together. There were a lot of bougie things there. A lot of finer things of life were found in Philippi. And so they get there and they kind of rest. And then this is what happens um, in Acts 16. It says, then you will, oh, I missed a verse, yeah. 
It says, then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good and pleasing, perfect will. Um, But this is what happens. It says, on the Sabbath, we went outside to the city gate to the river, where we expected to find a place of prayer. We sat down and began to speak to the women who are gathered there. So Paul and his, his disciples are speaking to these women. One of those listening was a woman from the city of Thyatira named Lydia. As a dealer in purple cloth, she was a worshiper of God. And then it says, the Lord opened her heart to respond to Paul's message. When she and the members of her household were baptized, she invited us to her home. And then let's see what happens. It says, if you consider me a believer in the Lord, Lydia said, come and stay with my house. And the author says, and she persuaded us. Now, some of you know this story, but if you don't, I'm going to break it down for you real quick, okay? So Paul, Saul, had this like come to Jesus moment, right? Quite literally. Uh, God brought him to his knees. He decided to be obedient. He accepted the reality that the Son of God was real, that, that God's purpose for his life was bigger than what he was doing. He committed to di- discipleship. He committed to obedience. Um, he committed to the best life possible found in Jesus. And despite wanting to go to Asia, despite wanting to bring the gospel there, God said no, and he said, okay, I will won't do that. And then he meets this woman named Lydia. Now, Lydia, I like to describe her as um, an independent woman who don't need no man, because Lydia was a purple cloth dealer. Now, purple cloth at the time was one of the most expensive uh, cloths to make and to sell because to dye clothes back then was very difficult. It was a long-consuming process. And so that meant that Lydia had money, right? And we're not talking like, girl, you can get a large fry at McDonald's kind of money. No, we're talking like, hey, we're going to Ruth Chris and it's on me type of money. You know what I mean? Like, like Lydia was balling. She, she was ready to go. And get this, get this. She lives in a city called Thyatira. I'll give you one guess as to where that city is located. Asia Minor, everybody. And so Paul meets Lydia, who has resources, probably influence, and has a home base in Asia Minor. A lot of theologians actually believe that the gospel first entered Asia because of Paul's connection to Lydia. That because of her influence and what she brought to the table, that they were able to launch a church in Asia. So who do you think Jesus was thinking about when he told Paul, no, you can't go to Asia? Lydia. Who do you think Jesus was thinking about when he told Ananias, yes, you will pray for Paul, even though you don't want to? Lydia. Who do you think Jesus was thinking about when he impacted Paul, brought him to his knees and said, this isn't the life for you. I've got more for you. Lydia. Who do you think Jesus was thinking about while he was crucified? on a cross. Lydia. Thank you. Come on. Some of y'all need to have faith like that. But he also thought of you. Yeah, you. And he thought of me. And he thought about all of our life steps and everyone we would encounter. My last question I want to pose to you today is this. If I'm going to fix my focus on Jesus, is there more potential for my life than I realize? Is there more potential for my life than I realize? I have become aware of the fact that there are thousands of people whom I owe my salvation to. Thousands of people, starting with Jesus himself, millions of decisions to be obedient, to pray, to show up when nobody else wanted to, to set up chairs when nobody else wanted to, to clean floors and, and, and air fresh in the hallway, and, and, and Pastor Andy and Sharon saying yes to God and starting a church. I am so thankful that I found God in high school because I believe it's going to save me from a lifetime of horrible mistakes, decisions that I could have made. Now, I'll be honest, I still made some of those. But God's grace is so good. It's so powerful. You see, the downside to that, though, is that over the past 10 years, I have probably seen thousands of people from every generation, black, white, any person of color, male, female, walk through those doors right there. Sit in a seat that one of you is probably sitting in. Say yes to Jesus. And then at one point or another, have walked away. I mean, friends, like people I served with, people I was in small groups with, people who led worship, people who saw miracles and healings happen before their eyes who are no longer serving in the church. This song that we did earlier, First Love by Hillsong Young and Free, is so special to me. 
because I feel like it perfectly kind of sums up how I feel about the dozens, if not hundreds of friends that I've made in the church who God has moved mightily on their lives and then they've walked away. And some of you can relate to that. You've had family members or children or friends come to Jesus and then something happens in their life and it pulls them away, whether it was their fault or or just extenuating circumstances. The topic of my message was originally bringing out the best in others, but that title didn't feel right. Because the best thing for my life, the most essential thing that I believe is for me and for everybody else, doesn't even come from me. My prayer for you today is that you realize your life has more impact than you know. That one yes to receive Jesus today could create a generation of Christians after you. One yes to be obedient to Jesus today could break cycles of divorce. One yes from Jesus today could break cycles of addiction. Like God has so much more for your life than you even realize. Shoot, there was somebody in Starbucks right now, week in and week out, who was waiting to hear the gospel, but one of us in this room needs to say yes in order for that conversation to happen. This song, man, this song, it gets me every time, and it's, it's like a prayer to God. And I just want to read some of the lyrics to you. It's the second verse. It, it just like hits me in my heart. In the second verse, it says, God, this is all I pray. Over everything I ask, that my friends one day come back. Can you help with that? God, I know you can. Because this fire doesn't mean a thing if it ends right here with me. No, you want more than that. And then we get to the chorus. And this chorus is so strong and it's so powerful. And it says, set me on fire like I've never known. Church, God is is instilling fires inside of us that look like passion for the Lord, passion for life, passion for the best life possible in Jesus. And if you accept this passion, if you receive this fire, man, I believe that it will radically change your life and the life of those around you. But Jesus says it this way in Matthew. He says, you are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to the whole house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. The best life possible comes from fixing your focus on Jesus in everything. And just like Paul, your relationship with God will have unexpected impacts on you and on those around you. No longer do I want you to say that my religion is a personal thing because it's not. Your faith in God is not an individual thing. It starts there, but there's so much more to it. I wanna run through three things that I think if you just change your mindset on them, that God will move in you. The first one is this. It says, every time I pray, it's an investment in others. In your car, in your bedroom, in the shower, um, driving to and from work, at Starbucks, wherever it is, you don't even have to pray for people, but the fact that you're praying and talking to God, edifying your spiritual life, will edify the spiritual lives of other people. Every time I worship, it's an investment in others whether that's in your room with your, your headphones in or, or to, to a, a YouTube video or when you come into this auditorium, when you lift up your hands in worship, it is not a show for me or anybody else. It is saying, God, I am reaching out to the things of you and if I can achieve your best, God, maybe I can bring somebody else along with me. And the last one is this, every time I read my Bible, it is an investment in other people. If you wanna know God, He's given us a resource, the Bible. Shoot, it's on your phone, the Bible app. You don't even have to read it. It can read itself to you. That's how awesome it is. Your relationship with Jesus is an investment, not just in you, but in others. I refuse to let this fire inside of me be quenched by life. I refuse to let it die with me. I refuse to accept the fact that I'm supposed to just live this life and die a death and then that's the end of it. No, God has more for us on this earth and he has more for you in the reality that you're living in. I choose to acknowledge that I am not perfect, but I serve a God who is. And if God can take this life, this prideful, thought he had it all together, impure, selfish 16-year-old and made him into a 26-year-old pastor that gets to preach on you in this stage, what more can he do for your life? What more can he change for you? 
I choose to acknowledge my reality. I choose to be obedient to God. I choose to recognize that his potential for me is far more. You wanna bring out the best in others? It starts with you. It starts with God in you. I have friends who are missing out on a lifetime with Jesus, a lifetime of grace, a lifetime of, of freedom, a lifetime of stability that is only found in God because they walked away. And I refuse to let that happen. So I pose these questions to you again. What reality do I need to acknowledge today? God, I'm not where I'm supposed to be, and I'm sorry. God, this sucks. I, I got myself in this position, but I'm sorry, Lord. What makes up the foundation of your reality? How did you get there? What caused you to go there? And God, where do I need to be? What area of life do you need more godly obedience in? Just the one. Start with one. God, open our eyes to see what you want us to change, what you want us to be obedient in. And does God have more for your life than you give yourself credit for? I know the answer to that question, but to you. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much, Lord, for who you are. that you want the absolute best for us. And because of your son, Jesus, that absolute best is made possible. We don't have to put on a show, put on a facade. We don't have to fake it till we make it. Lord, no, you say, just come to me all who are weary and burdened for I will give you rest. God says his yoke is easy and his burden is light. God, help us see our realities. Every head bowed, every eye closed. God, help us see our circumstances. Help us see our struggles. God, give us the confidence and the strength to be vulnerable and say, God, this is a problem for me, but I won't let it be. I refuse to let my, I refuse to let my life continue this way, God. I come against some things in Jesus' name. God is, is bringing those up in your mind, and he's saying, yep, that's what I'm talking about. It's not of you, so give it to him. Give it to God. He said, I will take this from you. I will take this burden from you. It's not yours to carry. That's why Jesus died on the cross, so that we could receive those and lay it at, at his feet. Those nails that went through his body also pierced through our sins. So, so God, we, we just give those up to you today. Lord, I ask for obedience to say yes. Maybe it's to get prayer for that today, to not wait until tomorrow, to not wait until you feel like you look good, but to come up front at the end of service and receive prayer today. God, I thank you for that. Now, I want to speak to the people who haven't yet made that decision to say, Lord, you do have the best life. You did die for me. You are my Savior, and I want that life. If that's you, every head bowed, every eye closed, I want to give you that opportunity today to pray that prayer, to acknowledge, just like Paul had to, that the Son of God is real and that his sacrifice was eternally impactful and that he did it for you. So every head bowed, every eye closed, I'm going to count to three, and I'm just going to ask you to just raise your hand high enough for me to see it. I'm not going to call you up front. I won't put spotlights on you. I won't trick you and have everybody look around for you. This is between you, me, and the Lord. I just want to know who I'm praying for. So every head bowed, every eye closed, if that's you, if you want to make that decision to say, God, you are my Savior, you are my Lord, you have that best life, and I want it for me, if that's you, one, two, three, raise your hand right now. I see you. I see you. I see you. So you can put your hands down. I want everyone from the front of this room to the back of this room to pray this prayer with me. Everyone say, Jesus, I know I mess up. I know I make mistakes. But today I trust you. Today I follow you. Make me new. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Can we give it up for those people that just raised their hands, everybody? For tuning into today's message. If God is impacting your life through this ministry, join us in reaching others by investing today. You can give by texting your donation amount to 757-230-2110 or by going to vineyardchurch.com slash give. Also, don't forget to subscribe to our channel so that you never miss an update. We'll see you next week.